but I am clocking in to talk about some bio fun relating to photosynthesis, which is always fun for everybody. So, um, just a word of warning, if you hear any purring, me yelling at something called Figaro, or uh, snoring in the background, that is my cat Figaro. He always makes appearance in these videos. Um, and right now he is tearing around the apartment with um, a Sharpie marker that he has found, and I don't know where he is, but he's bound to appear at some moment in time. Anyway, so back to the topic of the matter here. So I like to say life on Earth is um, solar powered because photosynthesis nourishes most of the living world, either directly or indirectly. Um, there are autotrophs, your cell feeders, um, and biological producers, and heterotrophs, which are your consumers. So autotrophs can sustain themselves without eating anything derived from other living things, and they produce organic molecules from carbon dioxide. Plants in particular are what we call photoautotrophs um, because they use light as a source of energy to synthesize organic compounds. As such, they are the ultimate source of organic compounds required by heterotrophs, uh, largely for energy. Almost all heterotrophs are completely dependent on photoautotrophs for food and for oxygen. Uh, which is a byproduct of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis produces carbohydrates, um, which is an energy source that heterotrophs will use to power the synthesis of ATP via cellular respiration. Okay, so what is photosynthesis exactly? I keep mentioning it, but I still have not told you what it is or what it entails. So photosynthesis is a multi-step process that requires sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water as substrates. Now the products, well, it releases oxygen and produces um, something called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or what I'll refer to in short here as GA3P. Um, this is a simple carbohydrate molecule that can then subsequently be converted into glucose, sucrose, etc. So photosynthesis evolved as a way to store the energy in solar radiation as high energy electrons in the carbon-carbon bonds of carbohydrate molecules. That's why we're talking about it today. At this point, a lot of students start running into issues or falling down on the ground crying with photosynthesis, um, largely because they start confusing it with uh, the processes, reactants, and products of cellular respiration, which is understandable um, when you're just learning about these two concepts for the first time. And it's also understandable because there are several, several commonalities. For example, both are redox reactions and are essentially opposite reactions of each other. Now, it's actually a, quite a bit more complicated than that, but for simplicity's sakes, let's just say that. So plants use photosynthesis and cellular respiration, right? But animal cells only use cell respiration. We do not have chloroplasts, remember? So I found the best way to prevent confusion um, is and was to think of photosynthesis and cell respiration in two completely separate boxes, on completely separate um, sides or opposite sides of the room. I don't want you to forget what I've talk to you about cell respiration, but for the moment, I want you to take that information, put it in a little file folder, and put that in a filing cabinet, right? I want you to only think of photosynthesis, not cell respiration. And in case you get confused along the way, I've provided this handy dandy little table that tells you the specific differences between the two, and again, kind of solidifies the point I made that they're opposite reactions. Now, as with other exergonic reactions, photosynthesis involves what are called energy transformations. In particular, the transformation of light energy into chemical energy. Now, the amount of energy transformed is dependent on the amount of light that's captured and photosynthesized. 
in other words, photosynthetic rate. Now plants will adjust their photosynthetic rate um, to the environment that they are living in. And by doing so, the actual biochemical composition of their foliage changes, uh, which is very interesting to see. Um, I don't think, well, it would be interesting um, to see if anybody knows what the, um, what some of the plants with the highest rates of photosynthesis are. I know that bamboo um, has one of the highest rates, if not the highest rate of photosynthesis. Uh, fun fact, you can tell your friends. Now the process describing photosynthesis is this chemical formula. Um, it's actually the one shown on here, but um, it's six carbon dioxide plus 12 water molecules plus light energy. And that yields uh, C6H12O6, which is glucose, um, plus six O2 and six water molecules. Now, uh, the actual direct product of photosynthesis is actually not um, glucose. It's actually a three carbon sugar that can be used to make glucose. Um, We'll just fly with this. So water appears on both sides of the equation um, because 12 molecules of water are consumed and six molecules are newly formed during photosynthesis. Here's your six. Um, now we can simplify the equation by showing the net consumption of water, which is the formula that's displayed here. So photosynthesis is anabolic. And since it's anabolic, it, anabolic, it is also an endergonic reaction. Um, and it's anabolic because you go from smaller molecules to larger molecules of a carbohydrate, right? So you have a synthesis reaction, which is an anabolic process. It's also a redox reaction, meaning some molecule in the reaction is being oxidized and another is being reduced. So one is losing electrons, that's oxidized, while the other is gaining electrons or being reduced. Whichever is being oxidized is referred to as the reducing agent because it is losing its electrons to that molecule that is being reduced. The molecule being reduced, on the other hand, is referred to as the oxidizing agent. So water is split and electrons are transferred with hydrogen ions uh, from water to carbon dioxide, reducing it to a sugar. So carbon dioxide here is reduced to a sugar um, and water molecules are oxidized to um, your O2. Now one of the first clues as to the mechanisms of photosynthesis um, came from the discovery that oxygen um, that the oxygen given off by plants comes from water, not from carbon dioxide. Um, this was confirmed in about, I think, the 1960s using isotopes. Um, researchers actually used um, oxygen-18, which is a heavy isotope, um, to serve as a tracer that allowed them to follow the kind of the fate of oxygen atoms um, as they progress through photosynthesis. So what they did was they labeled either carbon dioxide or water molecules with this isotope, um, and they performed different reactions. So some reactions had um, uh, carbon dioxide labeled, uh, others had water labeled. And the researchers found that the oxygen-18 label appeared in the oxygen that's produced by photosynthesis only when water was the source of the tracer. So the hydrogen from water is incorporated into the sugar and the oxygen is released into the atmosphere. Um, now, because the electrons increase in potential energy as they move from water to sugar, um, you end up having a process that requires energy. Again, this is an anabolic process. Um, that energy will come from light, which we'll get into in a moment. So again, this is just showing you that for photosynthesis, you have the input or your products, uh, sorry, your reactants serve as carbon dioxide um, and water. And from that, you are going 
to obtain um, a sugar. Here it says glucose, but you're going to obtain a sugar and oxygen. Um, now you also have to put in um, water and some other um, minerals or nutrients. And these minerals um, include stuff like nitrate, phosphate, um, iron, and silica. So let's take a few moments to go over the anatomy of leaves, since they're pretty important um, to this process. Leaves are the major site of photosynthesis for most plants. And there are about half a million chloroplasts per square millimeter of leaf surface, um, which is a lot. The green coloration of a leaf is derived from chlorophyll, which is the green pigment of chloroplasts. The process of photosynthesis occurs in a middle layer called the parenchyma or the mesophyll, um, which is right here. So the mesophyll um, is composed of what's called the um, palisade parenchyma and spongy parenchyma. And again, this contributes to the overall parenchyma or what most people call the mesophyll. So the mesophyll is um, where you have chloroplasts um, that are largely found as well as chloroplast containing cells. So oxygen will um, exit and carbon dioxide will enter the leaf through these microscopic pores called stomata, which are right down here. Let's see if we can get a better image. Um, here we go. So the stomata are the site of gas, uh, gas exchange. They're typically located on the underside of the leaf. Um, here they call them stoma. I call them stomata. Um, that's just what I learned in botany. So um, anyway, they're typically located on the underside of the leaf to minimize water loss through transcription. Each stomata is flanked by guard cells, which regulate the opening and closing of the stomata by um, swelling or shrinking in response to osmotic changes. And then veins will, um, in the leaf you have um, your xylem and phloem, they'll deliver water, um, your xylem will deliver water, phloem will deliver uh, nutrients um, from the roots. Now there will be anywhere from 30 to 40 chloroplasts in a mesophyll cell. Um, each chloroplast has two membranes um, around a central aqueous space, which is known as the stroma. Within the stroma, there's this, um, I guess you could call it an elaborate network of um, membranous sacs called thylakoids. Um, and these are the stack uh, disc shaped structures. So each one of these individually is a thylakoid. Now the thylakoid membrane encloses an internal space called the thylakoid lumen, um, here labeled as the thylakoid space. Now the thylakoids will be stacked in columns that kind of look like these um, stacks of pancakes almost. Um, these are called the granium. Now the chlorophyll itself is located in the thylakoids. So photosynthesis is um, composed of two sequential sequences or stages. You have light reactions or light dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle, um, also known as light independent reactions. Now the light reactions take place in the thylakoid and serves as a conversion of light energy into chemical energy, energy from Sunlight is absorbed by the chlorophyll and then used to make ATP and NADPH, which um, serve as your stored chemical energy. The Calvin cycle takes place in the stroma and uses chemical energy that's harvested during the light reactions to incorporate carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into sugar. Um, so it uses those products of the light-dependent reactions to make sugar molecules, or um, specifically your GA3P, glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, from 
carbon dioxide. Okay, so we'll start off with your light dependent reaction since they're the first process. So it makes sense to start there. So water is split um, and that provides a source of electrons and protons. Um, and in doing so, we'll give off oxygen as a byproduct. So light is then absorbed by, or sorry, light absorbed by the chlorophyll drives the transfer of um, electrons and hydrogen ions from water to NADP plus, um, this little guy right here. Um, NADP plus stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Um, so that conversion um, will then convert this into NADPH. And then NA, sorry, ATP um, will be generated through chemiosmosis um, in a po uh, process called photophosphorylation. Um, that refers to the addition of a phosphate group on ADP, right? So you're going to phosphorylate ADP at a phosphate group um, to create ATP, and that's energized by light. The light energy converted into chemical energy um, here is in the form of NADPH and ATP. Those are your chemical energy forms. Now light is a form of electromagnetic energy or radiation. Um, and like other forms of electromagnetic energy, it travels in the form of waves. Now, this is a very dry topic, but with the charm of photosynthesis, I have to dabble in this area for a little bit. Um, so I apologize if I bore you to death, but I'll make it very, very quick, I promise. Um, so, like I said, it travels in waves. Now, the distance between um, the peaks of waves, right, these little high points here, um, the distance in between those is called wavelength. So, even though um, light travels as a wave, it has many properties of what's called a photon. A photon is just a discrete particle of light. Um, the amount of energy that's packed into a photon is inversely related to wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the more energy that's packed into a photon. Now, the sun radiates almost a full electromagnetic spectrum, which is this guy up here. This is your electromagnetic spectrum. Um, however, the atmosphere filters out most wavelengths. So visible light is the only one that passes through with um, insignificant quantities. Um, and this is important because visible light drives photosynthesis. More importantly, it drives the light reactions of photosynthesis. Um, and that gets us into a concept of pigments. So pigments are compounds that absorb light. When light meets matter, the light is either reflected, absorbed, or tr uh, transmitted. In pigments, it's absorbed. It's also reflected, but we're talking about absorption right now. So the wavelengths that are absorbed will disappear, right? They're not portrayed as the color of the object. So let's take our little leaf friend, for example. A leaf appears green because chlorophyll, the dominant pigment, absorbs red, um, red and violet blue light. And in doing so, it transmits or reflects green light. So the light that's reflected serves as the color that you see. Right, so that's why leaves are green, because they reflect green light. Um, now, there are several major pigments that are contained in chloroplasts, um, the main ones being chlorophyll A, B, and um, your carotenoids. Um, they all differ um, in terms of absorption spectra. So chlorophyll A participates directly in light reactions and 
Um, it's awesome at absorbing red and violet blue wavelengths, but really sucks at absorbing green, which makes it great because it reflects green light out the wazoo. Um, chlorophyll uh, B absorbs from either end of your spectra and reflects your yellow-green light. Carotenoids absorb and dissipate excessive light energy um, that would otherwise damage chlorophyll um, or react with oxygen to form different compounds that would actually damage the cell material. Um, so in other words, it provides what's called photoprotection, basically protects it from damaging properties of light. So this here is the um, porphyrin ring, right? This is um, the light absorbing head of your molecule. So this will absorb different uh, wavelengths of light. Um, and then the stuff that's not absorbed, that's reflected, actually portrays color. So moving into the thylakoid, once again, we go back to our light reactions here. Um, when chlorophyll and other pigments absorb light, an electron is boosted to an excited state, right? Which leads us, again, back into our little light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis. So the conversion of light to chemical energy occurs in this multi-protein complex called a photosystem. Um, there are two photosystems that are embedded in the thylakoid membrane, um, and they both cooperate in light-dependent reactions. So you have photosystem two and photosystem one. Both photosystems have the same basic structure. They have a number of antenna proteins, which are these light harvesting complexes that you see here, um, to which the chlorophyll molecules are um, bound and um, will surround the reaction center where your photochemistry actually occurs. Now, each um, system is um, basically serviced, I guess you could, could say, by these light harvesting complexes. Um, and they'll pass energy from sunlight to the reaction center, this guy here. Um, and again, your reaction uh, center consists of these multiple um, light harvesting complexes or antenna proteins. Um, and they'll contain a mixture of about 300 to 400 um, chlorophyll A and B molecules, um, as well as your pigments like the carotenoids. So, um, I think that's all I wanted to say for that. If I remember more, I'll come back. So anyway, so you have these two photosystems, right? Um, and the whole process is going to start with the functioning of photosystem. Now, it sounds very confusing. Why not start with photosystem one? Well, they were named based on when they were discovered, not when they functioned. So photosystem two functions first. Um, so your photosystem two has a reaction center chlorophyll A, uh, known as P680. Right, that's this guy right here. Um, and that has an absorption peak at 680 nanometers, hence why it's called P680. Um, so P680 is that, again, that reaction center of photosystem two. Photosystem one has a reaction center, um, chlorophyll A, known as P700. Um, and that has an absorption peak at 700 nanometers. So these two photosystems, again, work together. Um, and they work together in using light energy to generate ATP and NADPH. So you have this, what's called um, a linear electron flow. That's really referring to this here. Um, or basically just a 
linear flow of electrons that drives the synthesis of ATP and NADPH um, by energizing the two photosystems. So photosystem two absorbs a photon of light. Ah, uh, here's your light, absorbs the photon of light. Um, one of the electrons of P680 is then excited to a higher energy state. Right, so it moves up to higher energy state. Um, your P680 uh, delivers its high energy electrons one at a time to the primary electron acceptor, which is this guy right here. So one at a time, these high energy electrons will be delivered to the primary acceptor. Um, this electron is then captured by the primary electron acceptor. Um, which leaves your P680 oxidized, right? So P680 then becomes um, 680 plus. The P680's missing electron, um, you're probably wondering how that's replaced. Well, it's replaced by extracting low energy electrons from water. That's what's occurring here. So that's how it's replacing um, those um, extracted um, or those missing electrons. So each photo excited electron, uh, going back up here, so each photo uh, excited electron will pass through um, or pass from primary electron acceptor of your um, photo system two. I'm just going to call them PS2 for short. So it'll pass from PS2 um, to PS1 via this electron transport chain, which is occurring right here. So the electron transport chain between PS2 and PS1 is made up of um, an electron carrier called, well, they don't have them labeled here for you guys, but um, it's okay, I'll describe it for you. So it's there's an electron carrier called uh, plastoquinone, or PQ. You have a cytochrome complex, um, and then you have this protein called uh, plastocyanin or cyanin, uh, PC. And then you move to your PS1, photosystem one. Um, so as these electrons fall from, uh, sorry, fall from your higher state to a lower energy level, their energy is heart harness to produce um, ATP. Um, and as they pass through these complexes, the pumping of proteins actually creates a protein, uh, sorry, a proton gradient um, that will then be used to generate ATP. So you have this um, higher concentration of um, hydrogen ions building up in here, um, and that's this is the uh, inner lumen of your thylakoid, and that's going to drive those hydrogen ions back across the membrane. They're going to go from high concentration to low concentration, simple state of diffusion, um, through ATP synthase, right? So that's your little enzyme here, or enzymatic channel, and that's going to produce ATP. Um, so you basically have photophosphorylation driven by chemiosmosis. Um, in other words, using light energy to drive these um, uh, hydrogen pumps and ATP synthase uh, by chemiosmosis. Okay, so going back here, um, meanwhile, while that's all occurring, light energy has um, come into photosystem one, so we have another source of light, um, and that has excited an electron of PS1's uh, P70 reaction center. So the photo excited electron um, bounces up or is passed to your primary um, electron acceptor, and that creates an electron hole in P700. Um, essentially, again, as you saw with P680, you're creating um, 
uh, instead of P700, you have P700 plus. So this hole is filled by an electron that reaches the bottom of the electron transport chain from um, PS2. So the photoexcited electrons are passed um, in a series of react reactions from um, photosystem 1's primary electron acceptor down a second electron transport chain um, through the protein um, paradoxin, or FD. The enzyme NADP plus reductase will then catalyze the electrons from um, paradoxin to NADP plus. Um, and two electrons are required for NADP plus um, to be reduced to NADPH. So you have the reduction of NADP plus here into NADPH. Um, and again, that's catalyzed by the enzyme NADP plus reductase. Um, and that's moving electrons from your paradoxin to NAD plus, sorry, NADP plus. Um, so your NADPH will carry the reducing power um, of these high energy electrons into the next stage of photosynthesis, which is your Calvin cycle. Um, so you can just think of the whole concept of the light reactions or what's going on in your light dependent reactions um, kind of as this. I don't even know how you would describe it. Some weird thing going on at a mill. People have very large hammers. Um, it's it's kind of like when you go to the amusement park and you have that huge um, like sledgehammer and you hit this little um, weight and it goes flying up. Um, it hits a bell and you get a teddy bear. Think of it like that. So you have a photon of light that comes in, bounces this... Um, electron from low energy to high energy because it's become excited. That's going to go down this little mill thing, right? This turns a little turbine that's going that serves as your ATP synthase that creates ATP, and then you have another photon of light that comes in and going to bounce up the electron that you obtained from photosystem two to oh god, I hope you didn't see that. So. Um, I apologize if you see my computer spazzing out. It's not a poltergeist. It is um, because I destroyed, well, I haven't fully destroyed, but I uh, kind of ruined the connection between my um, actual computer and the computer screen uh, because I spilled Angry Orchard on it. Um, and if you tap the screen, it spazzes out. So if you saw it spazzing out, that was because Figaro has now entered the room and rubbed up against my computer. Hi, Figaro. Anyway, so this will bounce up and then you get the formation of NADPH um, from the reduction of NADP+. Okay, so Calvin cycle. Um, so again, your light reactions, um, how do I want to put this? So they'll use the solar power of photons absorbed by PS2 and PS1 to provide this chemical energy in the form of ATP and reducing power in the form of the electron carrier um, given by NADPH um, to the carbohydrate synthesizing reactions of the Calvin cycle. Right, so the Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma of a coroplast, and this is when you have carbon fixation, or the incorporation of um, carbon molecules into organic compounds. Um, and the actual cycle is this cyclic series of reactions, right? Um, and they'll assemble sugar molecules um, using carbon dioxide, ATP, and NADPH. Um, from your light reactions. So carbon enters the cycle as um, 
carbon dioxide, sorry, lost my train of thought, and leaves as sugars, right? So um, your carbon dioxide enters the leaf through the stomata, where it then diffuses over short distances through these intercellular spaces until it reaches finally the mesophyll cells. Um, and once it's in the mesophyll cells, your carbon dioxide will diffuse um, into the stroma. Remember, that's your fluid kind of matrix or fluid fill component of the uh, chloroplast. Um, and that is, again, your stroma is the site of these light independent reactions or Calvin cycle. So the actual sugar product of the Calvin cycle, um, again, it's often referred to as glucose. Um, that's, I think, more put this on an air of simpler terms. Um, but in our undergrad level, we're going to talk to it talk about it on um, true terms, which is when you have um, a sugar product that is a three carbon sugar. Again, that is your glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Um, so each turn of the Calvin cycle fixes one carbon. Uh, for each net synthesis of um, one glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate molecule, the cycle must take place three times, um, meaning it fixes three molecules of carbon dioxide. Um, now, if you wanted to make one glucose molecule, like is shown in many of these um, images from good old Google, um, that actually requires six cycles and the fixation of six carbon dioxide molecules. Um, so that's just in case you were wondering about glucose. Again, we're going to be talking about glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So the Calvin cycle has three phases. You have fixation, reduction, and regeneration of carbon dioxide, or the carbon dioxide acceptor, I should say. Um, so phase one is carbon fixation, right? Stage one, starting here. Um, so carbon is fixed from um, inorganic form um, onto an organic molecule. So in this fixation um, phase, each carbon dioxide molecule is attached to a 5-carbon sugar, uh, which is called ribose biphosphate, or RUBP. Right, that's what's going on right here when we're talking about rubisco. So what is rubisco? Well, rubisco is um, RUBP uh, carboxylase. This is um, the enzyme that catalyzes that reaction, um, that reaction being the attachment to a five carbon sugar. Um, So the enzyme rubisco, that's what we call it for short, incorporates carbon dioxide into an organic molecule called um, your 3PGA. Uh, PGA stands for 3-phosphoglycerate, um, and you're going to have two molecules of the 3-phosphoglycis, of oh my goodness, 3-phosphoglycerate um, for each carbon dioxide. Um, so you're going to get three of them that form, or for each one that reacts with RUBP, you get three. So from there, we can then move into reduction. Here. So ATP and NADPH, um, they're used to convert in this stage, the six molecules of three um, PGA into six molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So um, you have six um, molecules of both ATP and NADPH are used. Uh, for NADPH, um, 
both the electron and the hydrogen atom are lost, and that converts it into NADP+. Plus. Um, and for ATP, energy is released with the loss of the terminal phosphate, um, converting it back to ADP. Um, so one of the six glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates that are created um, will actually serve as a net gain of carbohydrate. In other words, only one of the six glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate molecules will leave the carbon, um, sorry, the Calvin cycle. Um, this molecule will exit the cycle uh, to be used by the plant cycle, sorry, plant cell, while the other five molecules are recycled to regenerate the three molecules of RUBP. So that leads us into regeneration of carbon dioxide acceptor, which is RUBP. So that's the third stage. So in, I guess you would call a complex series of reactions, the carbon skeletons of five molecules, right, that are the five molecules of D3P that remain in the cycle, um, are rearranged by the last steps of the Calvin cycle to regenerate three molecules of RUBP. Sorry, phosphate, I mean, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to put you in the bedroom. Oh, kitty cats. Somebody asked me one time, um, they were like, Professor Scam, do you have a boyfriend? I said, mm, no, I have a cat. That's my life, my cat. Anyway, um, where was I? Okay, so regeneration. Um, so this is the regeneration of your carbon dioxide, except so you have um, the rearrangement of your uh, carbon skeletons of the remaining five um, G3P. Remember, only one will leave the cycle. The other five remain in the cycle for this regeneration phase. Um, and they're rearranged to regenerate three molecules of RUBP. Um, to accomplish this, the cycle will spend three more molecules of ATP. So you have another energy expenditure. Um, the RUBP, um, after that um, expenditure of three molecules of ATP, is now prepared to receive uh, carbon dioxide again, and the cycle will continue. So the net synthesis um, of one uh, the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate molecule. For that, the Calvin cycle in total will consume nine ATP molecules and six NADPH. And then the light reactions will regenerate ATP and NADPH. And here's just a pretty picture. And here's just a summary of um, your light reactions. I think I asked a question about this on one of the exam preps. Um, but we'll stop there and then um, you can continue watching this lecture through um, the second part, which goes into um, talking about different types of plants and the photosynthetic uh, patterns that occur in those.